with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would descend upon us. Lord, that you will quiet the voices and the noises of this world so we can hear your voice speak to us through the word of God. Dear God, I pray for your anointing to speak your heart to the hearts of your precious people here. Do a work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans 12, looking at verses 1 and 2, the title of this message is, Watch Out for This World. We need to watch out for this world. I don't have to tell you that. We're at war. We're at war with this world. Many of you think, as Christians, that we're on the love boat. <laughs> now, now, some of you, you, you know, you my age and older, you remember the love boat. Those of you 30 and under said, what, what was that little jingle? <laughs> Google it, you know. But we're on the battleship stationed at the gates of hell. We're at war. And we got to understand this. The Bible makes it very clear. It, is, it says, you know, uh, endure hardship as a good soldier. For no one who, entang uh, uh, no one who is warfare entangle himself in the affairs of this life, but to try to please him who enlisted him to be a soldier. We're in the soldier. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand and done all in the evil day to withstand. So we're in a battle here. But how do we deal with this world? Because even though our spirits are saved, our bodies are not. And our bodies love everything about this world. It's entertainment, it's music, it's, it's desires, it's... The world appeals to all five of our senses in an incredible way. And our bodies can get in the way. Our body appetites can get in the way of us being all that God wants us to be. So how do we deal with this? Well, this is what Paul is going to be sharing with the believers here at Rome. You got to understand, you know, Paul, his typical way of doing things, he spent the first 11 chapters telling them what God had done for them. And then in chapters 12 through 16 is what we need to do for God. It's always doctrine before duty. This is, this is his MO. This is what he does. In the book of Ephesians, spend the, three, the first three chapters dealing with doctrine, telling them what God has done for them. The last three, what we need to do for God. That's always the way Paul does it. That's always the way it is. So he just finished 11 chapters just laying it all out for him. All that God has done for us. The many of the great doctrines of the Christian faith that we believe to and hold to are in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans here. So here we are in chapter 12. Dealing with that section that's telling us now this is what we need to do for God. Paul is going to give them some instructions on how to deal with this world because Roman culture was just as wicked as American culture. And so he's given these believers in Rome some instructions on how they're to wage a good warfare in this world that they were living in at the time. Now, we're going to read these verses and we're going to come back and pick them apart and see all the nutrients and nuggets and trinkets and stuff that God has for us in this word. Look what it says there in verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Let's stop right there. Notice the first thing he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. Oh, the word beseech there, the Greek word is parakaleo. It's an amazing Greek word. It means to come alongside of to help. It's a great word that, that is used there. And, and the Apostle Paul, he, he uses this word uh, to let them know that he's coming alongside to help them, encourage them, to urge them in their battle that they're about to face as they go out into Roman culture. Parakaleo. It's a great word. Great word. 
It's also a word, if you remember, it is a word that Jesus used in John 14, verse 16, uh, to refer to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the parakletos, the one to come alongside of, to help. Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit will come alongside of you to help you, to console you, to comfort you as I go back to be with the Father. Parakaleo, great word. Extra biblical writings use this word parakaleo to refer to a commanding officer about to give encouragement to his troops before they go out to battle. Me being a former Marine, I understand such language. A commanding officer giving his troops encouragement before they go out to battle. So Paul said, here I am, your spiritual commander in chief. I'm about to encourage you as you're about to wage war in Roman culture. And I'm here to encourage you, to come alongside of you, to help encourage you as you're going to leave these four walls and go out and engage this culture that we're living in. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Oh, he lets us know he's speaking to believers. Because what he's about to urge them, beseech them, encourage them, an unbeliever can't do it. An unbeliever can't wage war against the world. They're of the world. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, notice by the mercies of God. That's another indicator that he is speaking to believers. We know that we're saved by God's mercy. Uh, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So he's letting us know he is speaking to brethren here, to brothers. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, what is the first thing we should do? We should present our bodies as living sacrifice. The word present there is is a peristeme. It's a great word. It is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was used as a technical term to describe how the priest placed an offering on the altar. So it gives the connotation of surrendering, of giving up. And Paul tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because our bodies have been touched by sin in a powerful way. Sin has corrupted our bodies to the very core. And our bodies need to be placed on the altar. Meaning that our bodies can get in the way of us being all that God wants us to be. It it can get in the way, our body appetites can get in the way of us being all that God wants us to be. Oh, and Paul lets them know, and know in certain terms, in very graphic terms, he lets them know how sin has touched our humanness. Sin has corrupted our bodies to the core. He already said in... um, Romans 7, 18, he said, there dwells in me, that is in my flesh, no good thing. He said, the things I want to do, I don't want to do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? So Paul, in very graphic terms in Romans chapter 3 and verses 13 13 through 18, listen to how he describes uh, how our bodies have been devastated by sin. Listen to this. He said, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouths is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, if you don't see from that description how our bodies need to be placed on the altar and how sin has corrupted it to the very core, let me bring it a little bit closer to home. How about asking yourself whether your throat has been an open tomb, speaking words that's bringing death to your spouse and your children? Or whether your tongue has practiced deceit. You've just been lying lately, exaggerating the truth, telling half-truths. Or whether the poison of apps is under your lips. 
poisoning your children against your ex-spouse, poisoning employees against their employers, whispering in break rooms and whispering and texting each other and all kind of stuff, trying to dog your employer out. Or the worst yet, how about has the poison of apps been under your tongue and you've been poisoning church members against their pastor? Oh, see, this is real here. Whether your mouth has been full of cursing, you'd be surprised that there are people you're sitting next to, in front of, behind, who use profanity and call themselves Christians. Use profanity. You'd be surprised at how many people leave here and call their wives the B word, cursing out children in the car, and then come in the parking lot and then put the church face on. You know, the church face. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, brother. And just finish using that same filthy mouth to curse his family out. Oh, see, now we bring them a little bit closer to home. Has your feet been swift to shed blood? Has your feet been swift taking you places and going places you shouldn't be? Or whether the fear of God is before your eyes. Do you have the fear of God when you watch TV? The fear of God will govern what you watch. Do you have the fear of God when you take God's money and go watch filth on the big screen? at the movie house. See, now that we bring it close to home, because these are some very heart-penetrating questions, now you see why we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. You have to ask, ask yourself this. Which part, of the altar, which part of your body needs to get on the altar first? Is it what you see? What you're watching constantly on your phone when your wife is going to sleep? Or when she's not home going to the store or something? Maybe it's your feet that need to get on the altar first. You've been going places lately you shouldn't be going. Going to see someone that's not your spouse. Which part? Is it your tongue? Is it your mouth? Notice how most of these things have to do with this. Poison of apps is under their lips. Their throat is an open tomb. Their mouth full of cursing. Notice a lot of it has to do with this. This little thing called our tongue weighs about eight ounces. It gets us in more trouble. James said it has a straight pipeline to hell itself. James 3 verse 6. So notice how he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I'm so glad he said that. You know why? Because a living sacrifice can get on and off the altar. In the Old Testament, they will offer a dead sacrifice. Oh, you know the priest, in very graphic terms, the priest, you will come and you will bring your lamb as a sacrifice. And you will place your hand on that lamb because it, you are transferring your sin to the lamb. And so when the, when the priest killed the lamb, that poor innocent lamb died in your place. It was very graphic. You would lay your hands on, the priest would slit the throat. You would feel the animal slump to his death. It was very graphic that you felt that animal die in your place. But the Bible says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember, it, it speaks of surrender. You remember parastemi, it, it speaks of surrendering. It, it, it's a, a beautiful word as a living sacrifice. Oh, I'm so glad that he said that as a living sacrifice. Because see, we have two examples of a living sacrifice. You remember, you remember Isaac and, and, and Jacob, you know, or Isaac and Abraham, should I say. They went on top of the mountain to, he was to offer him as a sacrifice. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I could just picture it. The scene kind of went like this. You know, they made it up there. All right. All right, Dad. 
Where's the sacrifice? You it. Excuse me? You, you it. You the sacrifice. Now, you got to understand, Isaac was approximately 33 years old at this time. He wasn't this little boy that you see in the little children's books. He was about 33 years old, somewhere around there. He could have easily said, who the sacrifice? You are. Come here. Mm. He could have overpowered his dad. Dad, over 100 years old. But he presented himself a living sacrifice, willingly gave his life. He was willing to give his life on that altar. Oh, we know the rest of the story, how the Lord stopped him and all that kind of stuff. We know the rest of the story. Jesus is the ultimate living sacrifice. He said, no man take my life. I give it freely. He gave it freely for you and for me. He took our place on Calvary's cross. He did it because of love. He's a greater love as no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. He took our place. That should have been him, an innocent person. And once again, the principle, the innocent dying for the guilty. And Jesus died for you. And so often we just poo-poo on the cross and what he, what he did for us. We take so... We take it for granted. But he was the perfect example of a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. That sacrifice is to be holy. Hagias is the Greek word. It means to be set apart for a purpose. Meaning that the sacrifice of the Old Testament had to be a lamb without blemish. It had to be perfect in a sense that ultimately pointed to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we are to be holy, not sinless. We can't be that. But we can be holy. And we have to be holy to enter into God's presence. Oh, the psalmist taught us that in Psalm 24. He says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, but he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Men, you can only take your families. As far as you have, you have gone yourself. Single parents, you can only take your family as far as you've gone. You can't take them into the presence of God if you've never been there yourself. There has to be a sacrifice that's holy, set apart for God's use. Are you set apart for God's use? God wants to use you, but are you set apart? Are you a vessel of honor fit for the master? Second Timothy tells us that. God wants you to be, but you have to be, be holy for he is holy. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Only a holy sacrifice is acceptable to God. Which is your reasonable service? Can I stop right there? I want to draw your attention to the word reasonable. The Greek word is lagakos. It is where we get our English word logic or logical. It means that which belongs to reason. And Paul is saying in light of all that the Lord has done for us in chapters 1 through 11, it is only logical, reasonable that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. It is our reasonable, it's only logical that we do this. It's reasonable, that which belongs to reason. It's a reasonable notice service. I want to draw your attention to the word service. Letraia is the Greek word. It means service of any kind. However, letraia was used in the Old Testament to speak of worshiping God according to the prescribed Levitical ceremonies. In other words, the priestly service was a part of Old Testament worship. So this says to us that we need to live a lifestyle of worship. Worship is not a genre of music. Worship is not what we do before the word. We, we call it worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship, proskuneo is the Greek word. It means to turn and to kiss. It means to adore. 
And as we're worshiping God, we're turning, we're kissing him, we're adoring him for doing so much for us. We are exposing ourselves before the light of God. God is light and in him is no darkness at all, the Bible says. And so as we're exposing ourselves to the presence of God, he is showing us all of the dark areas of our lives. He is pointing out, you need to apologize to that coworker tomorrow. He is pointing out the way that you talked to your wife was not right. What you said to your brother was not good. And he's exposing those things as we're in the light of his presence. And we're like, oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for doing that. And, and there's a beautiful thing that takes place. Watch this. As we are talking to God through worship, he's going to speak to us through the word. And we leave here having a dialogue with God and not just a monologue. Because many of you, you come late and you say, well, you know, it's just that music. You know, we got time. As long as I get there for that word, you know, I want to get that word in. But if you have not soaked in God's presence through worship, if you haven't done that, then when I say something or Pastor Skip says something in the word, watch this. This is what you would do. I don't agree with that. I know. But when you have opened up the dialogue through worship, expose yourself in the presence of God who is light. You've already had a conversation with him. You've been talking to him through worship. You know, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. And you say, Holy Spirit, come. We're asking the Spirit of God to come. We're talking to him. So when he speaks back in the word, we're like, oh, Lord, I received that. Because we already started the conversation with him. You're not doing one of these numbers. The head must turn. <laughs> the head turning means you're not even worthy to be heard on that point there. That's what it means. So God is trying to do a work in us through worship, a beautiful, beautiful worship. So worship is a lifestyle that we must understand. And so what's amazing about this is because of that particular word, letteria, it, it, it means, you know, yes, it means service of any kind, but it was the way the Old Testament priests worship God. This is why many translators translate this last portion as, you know, uh, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. You may have a translation that may have that. This is why they translated it that way. Oh, what else? What else needs to happen? Notice verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The conjunction and that starts out verse 2 means that that's the conjunction that connects. is connecting what was just said to what is about to be said. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And while you are at it, do not be conformed to this world. Oh, I love that word, conformed. The Greek word is soukismatizo. It's a great word. It's where we get schematic from. It means that which uh, it, it, it's a scheme. It, it, this word has a, a, a very, very deep definition. It means an outward expression that doesn't reflect what is within. It was used of masquerading or putting on an act specifically by following, here it is, a prescribed pattern or scheme, schema. It's where we get, like I said, schematic from, for those of you who are in construction. The verb is passive and it describes something we are allowing to be done to us. 
And this is why the word not in be not conformed is negative. And Paul is giving a command for us to not allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. In other words, we are not to masquerade as a person of this world. Or I love the J.B. Phillips translation of this verse. He says, do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And that is what the world is seeking to do. Squeeze us into its own mold. You got to understand, squeezing speaks of pressure. It's like, you know, the, the lemon, lemon juice that I put in my tea this morning, I was squeezing it so the juice can come out. You take oranges to squeeze it. It speaks of pressure. And the world wants to pressure us into seeing things the way they see it, talk the way they talk, do what they do, and is seeking to squeeze us and putting pressure on us as believers to see things their way. And now we got believers calling sin a disease. Why? Because the world has been squeezing us to see things their way. Things that are sin, clearly in the Bible. The world says it's a disease, so then you come into church Well, the Bible says blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, that's a disease. The world is squeezing you into its own mold. Squeezing you into its own mold. That's what the world seeks to do for you and to me, to apply pressure on us until we finally see things their way. Oh, it's done to us all the time. I wish I could get into some specifics, but I want to be invited back one day. So... I'm going to get into the specifics, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't have to tell you. Alcoholism is a disease. Then where's the medicine to fix me? I can get medicine for cancer. Where's the medicine for alcoholism? Can I go to the pharmacy, Walmart, Walgreens? Where's the medicine if it's a disease? The Bible calls it sin. But where's the medicine? I take medicine for every other disease. Why can't I take medicine for this? I won't get started. Y'all quiet. That's okay. (laughs) A disease? Don't you allow the world to squeeze you into a schematic. Because that's what it seeks to do. For those of you in construction, you know, before you build anything, you got to have the blueprints, the schematics. And you build that building based upon these schematics. The world wants to squeeze us into its schematic. And so we think we go down the hall on the schematic. We make a right on the schematic. And it wants us to be in the rat race right along with them. We're at war with the world. We're not to be speaking like the world, talking like the world. This is why it's foreign for a believer to to think it's okay for him to use profanity. We don't talk like the world. You cannot use that language and still call yourself a Christian. You cannot. Why? Because the Bible says in um, Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. So as Christ is in my heart, then I won't be talking like that. Why? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if Jesus is there, then I'm going to speak the words of Jesus. If Jesus is not there, then I'm going to speak all kind of crazy stuff. This is why I said that you cannot call yourself a believer and still think that things are okay. And still, I'm I'm fine. The world is squeezing you into its mold. Do not be conformed to this world. But, you see the conjunction there? The conjunction but. It is the conjunction of contrast, meaning that what I just said, what I'm about to say is going to be in the direct opposite direction. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I love the word transform. The word transform is metamorpho. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's that process that the caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. What a great, great description to describe us. We were worms. 
I know you thought you were more than that. You're a worm. I was a worm. And because Jesus has been transforming us, we're able to become a, like a beautiful butterfly. And we can soar. Whereas before we were crawling around in the dirt in, of, of sin. But we're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that's where our beauty comes from. Not because you think you're beautiful. You're beautiful because we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Amen. This same Greek word is used. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all, it was a little delayed. You know, that's it. Okay, I got you. The, the same Greek word was used in Matthew 17, verse 2. You remember when Jesus was on top of the Mount of Transfiguration? It said that he was transfigured, metamorpho. It, 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 it meant that his deity was shining forth through his humanity. And as we're being transformed, the same thing is happening to us. Well, it should be, at least, where all of a sudden we're transfigured, where Jesus is shining forth through our humanity. So when people see us, they don't see us, they see Jesus. That's what should be happening. You don't want people to see you. I know you think you all that. You're not. You don't want people to see you. You want people to see Jesus. And I can tell you, I'm running out of time fast. So also the, that word is also used, um, metamorpho, is also used in 2 uh, Corinthians 3.18, which says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed, metamorpho, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, please keep in mind that the way we're transformed, notice he gives us the location of where we need to be transformed. Transformed, notice verse 2, in the renewing of your mind. We need to be transformed here. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, the Bible says. This is where we need to get reprogrammed, refreshed, rebooted, uh, restart, whatever modern term you can use today. This needs to be transformed. As, a, as we think in our heart, so is he. We need to be transformed in our mind. The way we're transformed is by the word of God. Oh, David said in Psalm 119, in verse 11, he says, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Colossians 1.28, it tells us as well. It says, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. God uses the teaching of the word of God to transform our minds. This is why it is so good that you're here. You're having your mind renewed right now. But the Asa said in the psalm, he said, my foot almost slipped in Psalm 73 when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But then later on down in that psalm, he said, but when I went into the sanctuary, then I saw their end. It's in the sanctuary that we see things from God's perspective. The longer you stay away from the sanctuary, the longer you, your foot will almost slip. When you see the prosperity of the wicked. How are they doing so good? They don't even love God. They're not serving God. I'm trying to serve God and I'm struggling. And man, that's what you say when you stay away from the sanctuary. But when you come into the sanctuary, you see things from God's perspective. You get taught the word of God. Your mind is renewed through the word of God. Now, I got to ask you, are you a person of the word? Are you a person of the word? See, you, you see, some of you are deceived and I'm going to help you. I'm, I came all the way from Virginia to help you. I'm your friend. <laughs> Some of you are deceived. You think because you came here and sat in a chair and you heard the word that you're okay. The Bible says in James 1, he says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own self. Meaning that Satan doesn't even have to deceive you. You're doing it to yourself by thinking, coming and sitting in the chair and hearing the word, I'm okay. It's not the hearer of the word that will be just in the sight of the Lord, but the doer of the word. See, so you think because I came here and sat in a chair, oh, I'm okay. I'm good to go. No, it's you doing this work. It's, see, you, it, I mentioned it all the other service. It's like going to Golden Corral. 
You know, you go to Golden Cry, you go there and pig out. You know, you feel, I paid my money. I got, I got it. I, I'm going to eat. I'm going to get my money's worth. You know one plate is good enough. You went two or three times because you said, I paid for a buffet. Now I'm going to get desserts and pile all that stuff and then they got to roll you out. <laughs> roll you out the door. But you know what? This church is a spiritual golden corral. And you get in a buffet of a meal from one of the greatest Bible teachers of our generation. And many of you, every Sunday, they're rolling you out of here. Because you're just coming and hearing the word and not doing it. You're not working it off. And you're a spiritual porker, is what you are. A spiritual fat person, that's what you are. Yeah, I came all the way from Virginia to tell you that. I'm your friend though, you remember that, I'm your friend. So we gotta be people of the word. This is why, or this is how we defeat Satan. This is how we defeat Satan in this world, by being a person of the word. You remember in Matthew 4, Luke 4, you remember Jesus defeated Satan with the word of God. That's how we defeat him. That's how we defeat this world with the word of God. Satan came to Jesus with three temptations. All temptations fall under these three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. This is how Satan came to Eve in the garden, how Satan came to Jesus, how Satan comes to us. And each time Jesus said, it is written... It is written, it is written, because the word of God, the sword of the spirit, is the what? Word of God. So each time, it is written, it is written. Watch this. Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 6.13, Deuteronomy 6.16, and Deuteronomy 8.3. Let me suggest something to you. Those are, that's a very small portion of scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 8. I suggest to you that those were the scriptures Jesus was meditating on that morning. And it was the ammunition he had to defeat Satan during the day. And let me tell you something. Many of you have been defeated throughout the day that God wanted to give you victory, but you failed to get in the word of God that morning. I'm just not a morning person. Well, you better start becoming one. Because there's many times you've been defeated that God wanted to give you victory, but you failed to spend time in the word of God. When did the children of Israel collect the manna? Every morning. Jesus practiced this in Mark 1.35. Now early in the morning, having arisen a long while before daylight, he went out to a solitary place and there he prayed. Jesus spent time in prayer and the word of God. And it was the ammunition he had to defeat Satan throughout the day. Better get in that word. Better get in that word. How much of the word are you in? I'm reminded of Ezekiel in chapter 47. God told Ezekiel, go out in the water. He got in the water, came up to his ankles. You know, like the kiddie pool, you know, and them little toddlers and, and got the little floaties and, and the water, they just splashing and it's up to their ankles. Then God told uh, Ezekiel, go out a little further and it came up to his waist. Then he told him, go out a little further, and he had to swim, you know. I'm sure he, you, you know how y'all do it. I'm sure he, you know, me, when I should be turning, I, my face is in, I drown, and, you know. But he was swimming. How much are you in the word? Are you in the kiddie pool? Men, you can only take your families as far as you go. If you're in the kiddie pool, so is your family. Are you up? to your waist in the word of God? The waist speaks of the loins. It speaks of reproduction. You're out, you're sharing your faith, leading people to Christ, discipling them. You're just going for it. Or are you swimming? The Lord wants us swimming in that word. Getting in that word. And watch this, the last part, because I'm only down to two minutes. The last part of verse two. Notice he says that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? I want to draw your attention to the word prove. Uh, Dokimos is the word prove. It means to prove by testing. It, it, it gives the idea of how metals are proven to see the strength and weakness of a metal. You're going to be proved. You're going to be tested. And the way that we pass the test is we filter everything through the word of God. 
This is why we must be people of the word. Because the word of God will govern your life. The word of God will give you the ammunition to deal with Satan. Because many of you are testing, you fell in the test. You're failing. You fell in the test because you're not in the word enough to filter your actions and how you're being tested through the word. You're not in it enough to, 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 to even pass the test. The word of God, as you're being taught, as you're in it personally, you filter everything through the word of God. It was a big thing a long time ago. You remember everybody had a little brace at WWJD? You know, what would Jesus do? You know, it was supposed to be like when we look down, you know, we supposed, oh, uh, what would Jesus do? You know, no, Jesus wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, it was big. You know, whoever came up with that made millions of dollars and they're going off in the sunset right now. Some of you still got a couple of them on, don't you? you know, what would Jesus do? You know, that, that, It's supposed to be how we live. Now, in the 32 seconds I have, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> forgive me, children's ministry. Forgive me. Because I, I went over 17 seconds last service and I was hot about it. But what I'm about to give you now is worth this price of admission. Oh, y'all ready for this? Oh, I'm about to lay some gold at your feet. I don't know if you're ready for it, but some of y'all ready? I don't know. Yeah, I think y'all ready. If there's one question I'm asked, because it said that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. If I'm asked this one time, I've been asked a thousand. Pastor Tony, how can I know God's will for my life? I'm going to help you. Can I help you? I came all the way to Virginia to help you. This is worth its price of admission. I'm 11 seconds over. Oh, but listen quickly. Three ways to know God's will for your life. Number one, do you have a desire? It's not going to be on the screen. You just got to write fast. Do you have a desire? First Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.1 says, if a man desires the office of pastor, he desires a good work. Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in us both to will, that's desire, and to do the power to carry out his good pleasure. God works with a desire. So whatever it is you want to go, you want to move, you want to go to this state, marry them, take this job, do you have a desire? Number two, do you have a peace? Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. The word rule there in the Greek is a word that means to act as a referee, meaning that the peace of God will call the balls and strikes in your life. Like that decision you made, that was safe. Or that decision you made, that was out of here. You know you shouldn't have made that decision. The peace of God will rule in your heart. This is, you know, this is when super spiritual people, they just said, no, I didn't do it because I didn't have a peace about it. This is what they're talking about. <laughs> Number three, is the door open to close? Revelation 3, 7, and 8 says God will open up a door no man can close and close a door no man can open. Now watch this. It needs to be all three. Wherever it is you want to go, you want to move, you want to marry them, you want to whatever. Whatever decision you're trying to make, you want God's will. Do you have a desire? Now watch this. If you have a desire and you got a peace about it, but if the door isn't open, don't you go kicking it in. It may be God's will, but not his timing. You wait until it's to God's timing. Now, here it is. Let's say you got a desire. I got a desire to marry them. And the door is open. He asked me to marry them. But something is in you saying, you better not marry them. Uh, but Pastor Tony, my clock is running out. I just, I just, but he asked, I know he's not a Christian, but I, you know, I just, but you know, he... He, he, he said he might come if, to church if, I, if, if we get married. We, he said he might. He, he said it could be a good chance maybe on Easter. <laughs> you better not marry him. There's some women looking like this. <laughs> because they, they already did it. And they don't want to look at him. And the husband is doing this right here. She's not looking. It needs to be all three. It needs to be all three. It must be all three. Well, Pastor Tony, I got two out of the three. Those are great odds. Yes, for Vegas, but not for this situation. <laughs> it needs to be all three. Don't come up to me talking about you got two out of the three. It needs to be all three. Do you have a desire? Do you have a peace? Is the door open or closed? Simple as that. 
I'll just lay gold at your feet. I'm telling you right now, I just did. Now, here's the thing. Let me conclude with this. I'm already over. I'm, in, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. I'm, here, here, let me conclude with this. We're at war with this world. The way we deal with this world is by, number one, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, God, which is our reason. It's logical. It's reasonable. We do this. It's our reasonable service. It's the least we can do with all that the Lord has done for us. And while we're at it, we cannot be conformed. We can't let the world squeeze us into its mold. But we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's done through the teaching of the word of God as we get into the word of God. And it's through the word of God, through that great word, that we are proving what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will. We're filtering everything through the word of God. And finally, to know God's will for your life. Do you have a desire? Do you have a peace? And is the door open? Oh, I love laying gold at people's feet. That was worth this price of admission right there. Amen. 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 And Father, we are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful that you love us. You share these things with us because you love us. And Lord, I pray right now for your precious people. Lord, there's some right now about to make a big decision that they should make. This week coming up, I pray, God, you will stop them. Stop them from making the worst decision of their lives. Lord, there are some who are about to move, who shouldn't move, who are about to leave a job they shouldn't. God, I pray some are about to marry somebody that they know they shouldn't. God, I pray, stop them now. Lord, there are some here who have never prayed to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in their heart. They never repented of their sin. And they never confessed you as Lord. God, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for them. Move in the hearts of people today. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.